Welcome back to the New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. The CIA are the real cards against humanity. We got that story plus something worse than the GDPR. But first, it's that annual tradition when a select group of some of the world's richest and most powerful people get together this week for the annual Bilderberg Group Meeting. This year's gathering, the 66th annual meeting of the Mysterious Group, takes place in Turin, Italy, and it's happening from June 7th to the 10th. Meetings will be attended by American and European business leaders, current and former government officials, politicians, university professors, think tank analysts, and even some journalists. But it's all private, no notes, no recordings, but... Don't worry, they post a top 12 list of their alleged marquee topics. Number one on the list, populism in Europe. Number two, the inequality challenge. Three, the future of work for artificial intelligence. Five, the U.S. before midterms. Number six, free trade. Number seven, U.S. world leadership. Number eight, Russia. Number nine, quantum computing. Ten, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Number 11, the post-truth world. And number 12, I guess sort of the catch-all wild card current events. It should really also be noted that it was independent internet journalism that forced the Bilderbergers in the last several years to even start to share and post their agendas and their alleged attendees list in the first place. So the irony of a group of billionaires and politicians holding a secret meeting in fancy hotels to discuss inequality is some low-hanging fruit, but we'll take it. Among the alleged 2018 attendees are former U.S. Secretary of State. Of course, what would a Bilderberger be without Heinz Kissinger? We've also got former Director of Central Intelligence, David Petraeus, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, Governor of the Bank of England, Mark J. Carney, plus the President of American University, who you might know is kind of being connected at the hip with, of course, NPR. They got the Governor of Colorado, Google's Director of Engineering, a Washington Compost columnist, and Klaus Kleinfeld, the CEO of that new shining city on the hill, Neom. The meetings are regularly picketed by protesters and many critics of the event liken the gathering to a shadow world government. James, our colleagues like Luke Krakowski and Dan Dix are over there as we speak. Which of those 12 talking points, James, or perhaps any of the points that maybe aren't on that list are catching your interest about Bilderberg 2018? Yeah, well, I, like you, would like to know what the real agenda is, because, as you say, alleged agenda, alleged attendees, this is just what they put out to the public. Who knows? I mean, who knows? And even if this is the actual agenda list, it's, as you point out, so completely vague. Russia, populism, current events. I mean, who knows? Who knows, right? But the one that did stick out to me was um, the post-truth world, which... um, is an interesting, you know, of course, we've all heard this phrase coming up uh, recently. And uh, I, I don't know even know why, but for whatever reason, I was just uh, looking into that and looking at one of the attendees, Onora O'Neill, who um, is a Northern Irish philosopher and talks about the post, post-truth world and all of this. And uh, there's an interesting write-up on irishtimes.com from last year uh, talking about this issue and, and some of the things surrounding it. Um, which shows that she makes some, I think, valid points about the uh, topic. Uh, for example, she says, uh, I, take, I take it seriously, the, the faking that's going on in the media and things. I take it seriously, not this sort of modish vocabulary that we're living in a post-truth society or that everything is fake news, but that it's extremely hard to distinguish between genuine and fraudulent claims. And she says, uh, people can learn to make better judgments, um, but before trusting any putative expert, you should look for things like honesty, reliability, and competence. Yeah, okay, I mean, yeah, and broken clocks are right twice a day, I guess. But then she goes on to say that uh, we should stop looking to crude performance indicators like transparency. Transparency doesn't do what people fantasize that it does. And now she's going to Bilderberg. So there you go. I mean, we don't need tra- we don't need no stinking transparency. Let's be as secretive as possible. So I don't know. There's just I mean, that's kind of interesting to me. But as you say, alleged attendees, alleged agenda. We don't really know. And unfortunately, as we've pointed out, I think in the last few years, there isn't as much intel coming out of these meetings as there used to be back in the Jim Tucker kind of era, where you know there seemed to be more valuable intel and, and predictions and here's what they're they're talking about here's what they're planning now i haven't heard anything in years that actually gives any sort of concrete definite sense of what's really coming down the line and so it may be becoming less valuable to us as a, some sort of predictor for world events 
Well, and again, as, as we noted, they've only started sharing this information as they've pretty much been needled and poked over these last several years by independent jerks like us on the Internet, James. As you and I were prepping this to, to roll tape, we basically discovered that they've gone back on the Bilderberg archives and actually shared their topics list from every year going back. As it was the founding in, in 56? 54, yeah. 54. So it's all posted up there, James. And again, so they've actually kind of backtracked and filled in some of the info, and we will include the links to some of that info, as we always include everything we say and play in the show notes. But yeah, I was kind of wondering, there's vague categories. They almost sound like Jeopardy categories. I'll take current events for 200, Alex. This is New World Next Week, episode 342 for June 7th, 2018. And our second story this week comes after GDPR Day, when the general data protection rules kicked in about a week or so ago. So lots of people are now waking up to a world in which EU regulations are having a widespread and not always positive impact on how the Internet works. Believe it or not, there's an even larger threat from the EU looming, and it's received precious little attention. The EU's new copyright reform proposal is set to be voted on, and it will truly be disastrous to the Internet. As it currently stands, it will require widespread censorship in the form of mandatory filtering and also link taxes that have already been shown to be harmful to news. European Parliament member Julia Retta is one of the folks sounding the alarm, and she goes on to detail the many, many problems of the current copyright proposal in which merely linking to a news site may require paying money, the link tax, and where concerns about how that might negatively impact the entire internet are, of course, being ignored. Perhaps even worse is the mandatory filtering idea. The big record labels and movie studios, James, of course, have been pushing for this kind of thing for years to get back at Google mainly, and of course, of course, their GooTube arm, and Facebook a little bit, but here's the thing. Both Gulag and Fedbook already have all those filters in place and spent tens of millions of dollars on them. As Retta points out, most of the EU member states appear to be not only supportive of these horrible ideas, but they're into actually pushing even worse ideas. What now stands between this horrible law making a mess of the internet, making more of a mess of the internet, is just the EU parliament, which is currently scheduled to vote on this in late June, probably right around the, uh, you know, summer solstice, June 20th, 21st. So, James, do our friends over in the EU possibly watching these New World Next Week episodes have a chance to fight back against this? Uh, possibly watching and possibly fighting back, yeah. Um, <laughs> and for people who are interested, there's uh, the aforementioned Julia Retta on her website has her latest post, How You Can Save Your Internet from Article 13 and the Link Tax in the Next 14 Days, basically encouraging people to, uh, to get the, in front of their MEPs and and uh, make sure they, they vote the right way and all of that. Yeah, yada, yada. Okay, great, awesome. Political action, we're going to save the internet by pleading with the masters to please don't pass these draconian laws. And I am not dissuading anyone from getting on board with that train. Go for it. But a couple of things about this. One, I would suggest if you are concerned about this, if you are genuinely concerned about this issue, take the 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is, to actually read this legislation. Don't just take people's interpretation of it as this is the gospel truth of what it says. No, go and read what it actually says. It's legalese, it's gobbledygook, it's that kind of garbage. But you'll find that, yeah, what they're saying is basically this language is vague in a lot of different ways, sometimes intentionally and purposely left vague so that the 28 member states can each adjudicate in their own jurisdiction what it means, for example, for, for um, content that's being used to be substantial or insubstantial. And what constitutes that? Well, we'll let the courts figure it out. So really, the worst possible case, the worst court interpretation would be you can't link to anything, you can't have any links on your website, you have to have these upload filters. But it doesn't necessarily state that in this legislation in black and white. It's going to be a court process and long drawn out thing. And it could end up in that, you know, years down the road. So actually read this uh, proposal before jumping on any train. Um, and once you do that, and if, if you think that this is worthy of your time, absolutely sure, whatever, lobby MEPs or whatever you think is going to save the day. But as always, as always, I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that you can lobby till you're blue in the face, um, but you are not going to have the clout that the in the corporations that are behind this have. And a good reminder of that is a Tech Dirt article that came out last week uh, talking about this 
crazy event with this EU Today website, which is supposedly like an independent news website about EU matters. Um, they had this article up talking about how MEPs were being pressured on this issue, and they had a quote from someone who wanted to remain anonymous, basically saying, oh, you're not going to get anywhere in the party, you're not going to get any advancement, you're not going to get any cabinet position or placement if you vote the wrong way on this issue. There was all this kind of pressure coming down. EU Today took down that article and replaced it with a similar article that kind of takes all of those bits out of the article. They don't talk about the MEPs being pressured behind the scenes or the kind of things that the uh, lobbyists are doing to to threaten um, the MEPs to go along with this. So, I mean, as always, the political process is being engineered from behind the scenes, and even the people reporting on it are being censored or self-censoring or whatever the hell's happening at places like EU today. So... You know, again, good luck playing the political game, and maybe, cross your fingers, you'll win this time. But will you win next time? Or the time after that? Or the time after that? Or the time after that? Remember SOPA? Remember CISPA? Remember the 18,000 times we've already fought this battle? And it's going to happen again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, till the corporations get what they want. That's the game. It's a game of attrition. They're going to wear you down. So what is the real the actual, the long-term solution to these matters, not the, let's fight it on this piece of legislation, let's go lobby our members of parliament, let's hope they vote the right way on this thing, oh, 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 we won this one, yay, oh, we lost that one, oh, too bad. What is the way out of that? And the only way out of that is to start growing around the system of control, to be using decentralized technologies, to be furthering the the possibilities that have been opened up by torrenting and these types of things into IPFS and these kinds of decentralized internet ideas, made safe and things like that, where there's just nothing that they can do to control what's going on in that system. That's the only way uh, we, possibly that we can get ultimately uh, solve these problems. Now, I'm not even sure that these technologies are going to develop to fruition, but that's it. I mean, that's that's the alternative. Not lobbying your masters to, oh, please don't throw throw us into the, you know the, the the pit this time. Oh, good, we didn't get thrown into the pit this time. Let's let's all do this again in another year or two. I'm just getting sick of seeing the same stuff over and over and over and over, and people are just going to continue, I guess, voting their way to freedom. Uh, no. Well, they're they're going to get ready to vote harder because they're probably going to try and push a, another Brexit vote, it looks like. Again, just sort of going with the – they'll keep pushing it until you know Ireland votes the way that the EU would like them to vote. So James will include those links. Actually, I'm going to read about that EU Today article from our show notes. We'll also include – Tech Dirt actually interviews – MEP Julia Retta on their podcast talking about Article 13. So we've got vague meetings and we've got vague laws, apparently. Let's get very specific now on our final segment on this New World Next Week episode, and we'll keep playing the games, the game of attrition indeed. During South by Southwest 2017, the CIA revealed that they design elaborate tabletop games to train and test its employees and analysts. After receiving a Freedom of Information Act request, the CIA sent out censored information on three different games it uses with trainees, and thanks to diegetic games an adapted version of one of them will soon be available to the public cia collect it all is based off a card game described in the documents as collection deck which was designed by cia senior collection analyst david clopper its play style is roughly based on magic the gathering and demonstrates how different intel tactics can be used to address political economic and military crises and how the system often manages to screw it all up developed by the aforementioned tech dirt and diegetic games cia collect it all fills in the redacted portions of the game documentation with original content while the developers plan to tweak the game and add new rule sets before release, they showed The Verge an exclusive printable prototype of the changes they've made since that two South by Southwests ago. After playing the game, The Verge found it to be a fascinating look at the way the CIA trains its agents, even though it sometimes fell short of the total entertainment forever other rapid-fire games can offer. James, they unsurprisingly crushed their Kickstarter goal by a hundred or so thousand dollars, and honestly, I'd love it if somebody would buy a deck for the old media monarchy at the low, low price of $29 shipping this November. 
So, James, do you think maybe the CIA Collected All game has more or less predictive programming than the classic Illuminati card game? Hmm, interesting question. Well, I'm not sure predictive programming would be the right term for this, because mm. these are the people who are going to actually bring into being whatever it is they're doing. Maybe it's more like self-fulfilling prophecies of some sort. But anyway, it is... Yeah, I mean, people should go and look at the actual documents that they released on this to look at the actual cards in this, you know, that the CIA came up with. And if there's any solace in that, it's that at least they don't have any graphic designers or any. I mean, it's not it's not an exciting game kind of thing. It's just, you know, just bare bones writing and information. It's but at any rate, it's an interesting an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? That, I mean, talk about game theory. This is taking it to a whole different level. Um, but it just goes to show that people respond, uh, can learn new concepts better when it's put into gamification or when there is, are these types of different ways of approaching it. And that's even true if you're a CIA officer. So um, that's that's an interesting aspect of it. And something to keep in mind that... Yeah, the the games that we play and the things that we get involved in, yeah, they are they are help uh, helping to shape our understanding of the world, the way that we perceive things um, in ways that sometimes we don't appreciate. Anyway, the CIA certainly takes uh, takes account of that, and you can look at the cards yourself. Again, it's uh, it's pretty crazy stuff, but can we really be surprised this is going on behind the scenes? Probably not, James. That was a story I talked about a little bit earlier this week on my Morning Monarchy. I'll just do a plug here again at the end. I broadcast Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific Time at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, news, music, memes, and more. Awesome. Well, we'll leave it there for this week. Looking forward to next week. James, thanks for joining us. All right, buddy. Thanks. Take care.